Good evening and welcome to our midweek live stream service. We are so thankful you've chosen to tune in with us tonight. Each Wednesday we are taking a few minutes to update you on our church planters and missionaries. The Bird family, Willie and Patricia, are church planters in North Charlotte. God used him to start a Bible Baptist fellowship on the Air Force Base in Turkey, the Bible Baptist Church in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Northern Germany, and the Berean Independent Baptist Church in Alamogordo, New Mexico. After pastoring Berean for 25 years, God called him to Charlotte, North Carolina to reach black America and beyond with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. He and his wife, Patricia, have been married for 43 years. Pastor Bird served his country for 20 years in the United States Air Force and retired in 1993. While on full-time active duty, he was able to start four different churches. He is now serving Jesus Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina, and has seen growth in the church even with the meeting limitations from COVID. Let's continue to pray for the Bird family and New Beginning Independent Baptist Church in Charlotte. As we remember the Bird family in prayer tonight, let's also continue to remember all of our missionaries and church planters as they navigate their ministries during these days. At this time, we'd like to have a moment of prayer and encourage you, if possible, to pray where you are. Let's remember our pastor and wisdom for him as he seeks God's leading for the weeks ahead, the Graceway family to remain safe and healthy, and also for opportunities to share the love of Christ with those in need. Thank you for joining us in prayer for these requests and for remembering the Bird family. Now for our Wednesday evening Bible study from Pastor on the Lord's Supper. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study this evening. And I would like to invite you to join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, for those of you that have studied this book and are familiar with this chapter in the Bible, know that it deals with the Lord's Supper. Maybe you know it as the Lord's Table or even Communion. And I wanted to take some time tonight and share from this passage of Scripture concerning our observance of the Lord's Supper. I know that Paul was dealing with some troublesome issues within the church at Corinth. We've been studying early in this letter, and we'll eventually get to chapter 11. But I pause tonight because we understand this is an important passage of Scripture. It's important because it deals with one of the ordinances for the church, baptism being the other. And the reason that we, the church, attach so much significance to the ordinances is because both of them were instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ and commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ to be carried out by the church. And I'd like to invite you to just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll begin reading in verse 23. The Apostle Paul declares to the believers at Corinth, this is not something that he's invented, this is not something that he has thought up, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself... And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Sometimes we may struggle to know exactly what God's will is on a certain issue. But when it comes to this ordinance of the Lord's Supper, we are clearly commanded that this is a vital part of the obedient Christian life. And the Apostle just shared with us that on the night before his death, the Lord Jesus Christ gathered with the disciples in the upper room to eat the Passover meal, instituted this ordinance, instituted the Lord's Supper. You see, every year, Jewish people would gather together. That's what the Lord and the disciples were doing to celebrate the Passover. The Passover was, of course, a special meal designed by God to commemorate the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. After Israel had been in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years, God would deliver them. He would bring them out of bondage into the land that was promised. It was to be their land, promised to their forefathers. And you may remember that He brought on Egypt a series of plagues designed to free the nation from Pharaoh. And it was only after the last plague, the death of the firstborn, throughout the entire land of Egypt, that Pharaoh agreed to let the nation of Israel go. And the children of Israel, mandated to from God, protected themselves from the angel of death, which took the lives of the firstborn by taking the blood of a slain lamb and applying it to the doorposts and the lentils of their houses. Then they were to eat the roasted lamb along with some unleavened bread and bitter herbs. That was the Passover meal. And whenever the Israelite, whenever the Jewish people as they gathered together, and Jesus and the disciples were doing yet again here to observe the annual Passover feast, they were remembering the deliverance of God for the nation out of the bondage in Egypt. And the Passover still celebrates and remembers that historic Deliverance. Jesus took that feast, the feast of the Passover, that ancient tradition, here in the upper room, and He transformed it, as it were, into a meal with a new meaning. Transformed it as He instructs His disciples to drink the cup and eat of the bread of remembrance of His death on their behalf. Therefore, Calvary 
has superseded the exodus from Egypt as the greatest redemptive act in history. Christians do not pause and recall the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, but now we pause and recall the bloodshed at the cross. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. It is a remembrance that Jesus Christ Himself instituted. He became the ultimate fulfillment of deliverance from sin and death when He died on the cross and when He shed His blood. And we're commanded in Scripture to pause and to remember this because our remembrance of this truth brings about practical change in our lives. You see, without the blood, there can be no life within the physical body. And that's just as true of the gospel, of the Bible. Someone has said this, cut the Bible anywhere and it will bleed. Over 400 times the blood is spoken of in our Bible. It's not a minor theme. You see, without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the gospel is dead. Without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are deprived of eternal life. Just listen to Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, Jesus spoke, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Paul added this in Colossians 1, in whom, speaking of Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Peter added this in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. John then agrees with Peter and Paul as he writes in 1 John 1, 7, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. There is no doubt about it, the early church understood the importance of the blood. Twenty-two sermons, in effect, are recorded by four different preachers in the book of Acts, and all of them are giving the same message, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Gospel-centric messages. They understood that His death, that Jesus Christ's death, and His shed blood, that provision of the covering by the blood, was the essential ingredient of the gospel. And we know this, and Jesus commanded us to observe the Lord's Supper and to remember this. To remember the importance of the blood. To meditate on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And theologically speaking, we have a framework, an understanding of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We know that the shed blood of Jesus Christ was sinless. One of the core tenets of the faith is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It establishes His righteousness. Judas... As he betrayed Christ, he cried out, I have betrayed innocent blood. Paul explaining, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Speaking of Jesus, he said he knew no sin. Pilate, as he interrogates Jesus, as he questions Jesus, comes to this conclusion and announces, I find no fault in him at all. Jesus himself asked this rhetorical question, Which of you convinceth me of sin? He was spoken of in Scripture as holy, as harmless, as undefiled, as separate from sinners, as made higher than the heavens. Again, it was said of him, He did no sin and neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus Christ was sinless. The shed blood of Jesus for the sinner was sinless blood. A natural father would have imparted that sin nature of Adam to Christ. His death would not have provided redemption, but the virgin birth is absolutely essential to the salvation of souls because it establishes the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ is sinless. The blood of Christ is pure. 
Think for just a minute about the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 9, 13, as he writes, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot, pure, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If God, in, in His establishment of the law, said the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of the heifer, sprinkle the unclean, can sanctify the purifying to the purifying of the flesh, how much more then, the spotless blood of Christ, how much more then can that purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When the pure blood of the Savior, I'll emphasize this yet again, is applied to the sinner, it provides cleansing. John explained, again, as I reference his letter, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So when we sing the song that we are probably familiar with, we're singing Bible truth. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because it is pure, it is purifying. Boy, that shines a light on the reality that nothing that we offer is enough to take away the stain, the reproach, to cleanse us from our sins because our source is sinful already. The blood of Jesus Christ is sinless. It is pure. It is eternal. The animal sacrifice, as I referenced in Hebrews 9, of the Old Testament was continuous. It was done year after year. The blood of the bull, the blood of the goat, provided forgiveness. Temporary pardon. Only because it was now pointing, it was a picture pointing to the sacrifice of Christ and His blood being shed for the covering of our sin. And the writer of Hebrews speaks of Christ explicitly as a sacrifice. Hebrews 7.27 Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, speaking of Jesus, when he offered up himself. It's clear that he's being depicted as a sacrifice. The Bible states in Hebrews 10, 12, But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It doesn't need to happen again and again. It's not an annual event. It's not an annual occurrence. The blood of Jesus Christ is eternal. It is settled once and for all. Forever is the term that is used. The death of Christ is, is eternally cleansing. We are given the gift of eternal life, a salvation that He purchased with His blood. Thank God we are washed once and for all, forever saved. Not only that, this all reveals to us that the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. John wrote, Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Redeemed to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. It takes amazing power to do that. We're told that they overcome the wicked one, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 12. It takes a lot of power to do that. False religion has always denied the blood of Jesus Christ, has always tried to deny the power. A, 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 a terrible teacher, a, a heretic, says this, The red liquid that ran through the veins and arteries of Jesus' mortal body is not related to our salvation. It's foolish. Because we know that the blood of Jesus is sinless. We know that the blood of Jesus is pure. We know that the blood of Jesus is eternal, and we know that it is powerful. We understand the term acquittal. Acquittal is a strong term. It means to pay off. It means to free. It means to clear, to absolve. It kind of has a far-reaching meaning extending from the past all the way to the future, but that's what the blood of Jesus Christ did for us. Our past sin 
was covered by the blood of Christ. Our present sin, our future sins put under the blood when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Isaiah said this, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. David spoke to this when he stated in Psalm 103, 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. He promises not to remember them again. I will remember them no more against you forever. Now, of course, this is not to say we just go ahead and sin and live however we want to live. A truly saved person, a real believer, a follower of Christ, the child of God, won't have that kind of attitude. But we all know that despite our very best efforts, we're sinners. And we still falter and we still fail and sin and will yet sin. But we don't have to get saved over and over again. Do we need to confess to God and make it right? Yes, of course we do. As we continue to walk through this life, we'll need those daily feet washings. Praise God that one time, all over cleansing that we received at salvation secures us. And the Apostle Paul was dealing with a problematic church in Corinth. The reality is it was supposed to be pure worship coming together to observe the Lord's Supper. It was supposed to be a source of unity. But what was going on was the wealthy in the church were coming and they were eating it all early and those who didn't have the ability to come and observe and didn't have the wherewithal to have anything, the elements for it. They were getting there and it was all done and they were creating the caste system within the church of the haves and the have-nots. And The Apostle Paul is saying, you're abusing what the Lord's Supper is intended to be. It is a memorial. And he reminded them of how they were to observe it, of the impetus for the observance of the Lord's Supper. This do in remembrance of me, Jesus said. And so we pause... And we remember the shed blood of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. We pause and we remember that eternal God took on flesh. That the body of Jesus Christ was broken for us. And we remember this. We pause and we meditate on this. And we we straighten ourselves out, as it were, in accordance with our remembrance of the cost of sin. That is exactly what he said. As oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he comes. And then we won't have to do it anymore because he'll be there with us. But he says in verse 28, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Examine yourself. Judge yourself. Now I know that this is a strange season of life. And you're not able to be with us this evening observing the Lord's Supper. But I wanted to take the time to share exactly what I'll share with everyone tonight. A reminder that even though we may not be able to partake in this particular occasion, we can go to Scripture and we can meditate on and remember the shed blood and broken body of Jesus Christ. We can examine ourselves. We can judge ourselves. We can confess sins. We can cleanse ourselves. We can go to God and we can thank Him all over again for His shed blood on our behalf. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the privilege that we have of salvation. We thank You for the forgiveness of our sins and for the shed blood of Your only begotten Son, Jesus. I pray that you would encourage us tonight as we meditate on this. I pray that you would help us, even as we move forward through this week, to be clean and to be ready to serve you. We ask your blessing, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us in the middle of the week for a Bible study. We're thankful that you were able to take in pastor's thoughts on the Lord's Supper. I hope that somehow you sense God speaking into your heart and into your situation wherever you're at today. If you or someone you know could use comfort and prayer during this time, have them reach out to us at gracewaycharlotte.org. We would like to share with them that there is hope for the future, and they can find that through a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
If you wear glasses, try to imagine life without them. Would you be able to work? Could you drive? Could you even read your Bible? Life would be drastically different if you could not see well. Medical Missions Outreach assists underdeveloped communities all over the world by providing free vision screening and glasses, all while teaching about the God who loves and longs for a personal relationship with us. Graceway is excited to partner with Medical Missions Outreach in their eyeglass recycle program. And you can help by donating your used glasses that will be given to someone with your prescription who desperately needs them. You may bring your glasses that you no longer wear into church with you and drop them off at the eyeglass recycle box located in the church foyer. While 2020 might not be the best year in memory, donating a pair of glasses will make someone's year better by giving them 2020 vision. We hope you have a great week and remember, God works through people like you and me to change the world by the power of the gospel. We'll see you on Sunday.